Arts Commission. Um, I've been engaging in a little bit of uh, social engineering, getting you all to come down the front. Um, it's much nicer when you can see all those uh, cheerful, engaged faces uh, when, you, when, you, when you're speaking. So thank you very much for coming. We really do appreciate your very strong support for these rights talks um, at the Australian Human Rights Commission. And this is the first of the year. Um, and I'll be very delighted in a moment to introduce our speaker. Um, can I begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and respect their elders, past and present? Well, they say that um, every idea uh, must, uh, must uh, wait for its time. And it seems to me that this general topic of the relationship and engagement by the business community in human rights has really become a topic for the 21st century. It's actually a top priority for the Australian Human Rights Commission, and I thought I'd explain to you very briefly why it's become so important. And in a way, it's something that we've been aware of um, for much of our work. Uh, this is the 30th anniversary this year of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and as you will know, one of our primary functions is to receive um, inquiries and complaints from the, the public. We offer a free investigation and conciliation service, and uh, we receive a very high number, 23,000 a year, uh, gelling into about 2,300 formal complaints. Uh, but what we know from those complaints is that two thirds of them concern the business community or the delivery of goods and services. So that we, when our, our team for uh, investigation and conciliation attempt to, to understand what the, what the complaint is, whether the facts support it, what the law might be and how it might be engaged with it, um, we can both achieve an outcome in relation to the particular case, but we can achieve some systemic change. Um, and that we see as really an important contribution without having to go to the federal court to get substantive rulings on the, on the law. So we've learned from our own complaints process that the bulk of our work for most Australians, most of the time, concerns employment, discrimination on race, age, uh, uh, disability or gender. Uh, and whether it's an employment or delivery of goods and services, it's a very serious matter. So this year we are working um, with uh, the private sector, which has been terrific in itself, uh, on the uh, implementing uh, and understanding the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And I'm very pleased indeed to have um, Abigail McGregor with us, who is a partner with Norton Rose uh, Fulbright Australia, who's just going to say a few words. Um, before I do that, I would like, of course, to say how really delighted I am that we have Professor Robert McCorkadale with us today. It's, it's a huge pleasure. Uh, Robert's been a, a friend and a colleague for a few decades, rather longer than I care to think about, um, but a man who ha has been a very fine uh, public international lawyer and human rights lawyer. He was dean of the faculty at the University of Nottingham and the professor of international law and a barrister at Brick uh, Court Chambers in London. Um, he, uh, in fact, was my successor at the British Institute for International Comparative Law, uh, where he's been the director now for eight years and really done a remarkable job, among many other things, at uh, developing the, the Bingham Rule of Law Institute within the auspices of the, of the British Institute. Um, but uh, Robert is really remarkable and quite rare in being a scholar and practitioner in public international law and human rights, but also working in the commercial litigation area. He's worked with a major Australian law firm, King Wood Mallisons, and with Herbert Smith Freehills in London, so that he is really able to move across the branches of the law uh, from a human rights and public international law perspective to the practicalities of the business environment. And he understands, I think, far better than most just how important these UN guiding principles on business and human rights are. Um, now, would you, like, would you like to say a word now, Abigail? Or would you, okay, I'll pass over to Abigail, and then I'll ask Robert to, uh, to come and speak to us. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Abigail McGregor. I am a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright. I lead up what we call our Business Ethics and Anti-Corruption Group, which is a global group that um, we run that looks at issues just like business and human rights. We're finding an increasing interest from our client base in relation to how to manage their human right impacts, both uh, directly and then via their supply chain. Over about the last 12 months or so, Norton Rose Fulbright have been partnering with Bicul um, in order to uh, explore the concept of due diligence and um, the impact 
of businesses and human rights. Um, so it makes me very pleased to uh, invite in and welcome the professor here today. And I look forward to what he's going to say. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and particularly, of course, to have Gillian, who's been a magnificent president of the Australian Human Rights uh, Commission, which is not an easy task, as we all know. Uh, it's also been wonderful to be her successor as the director of the British Institute of International Comparative Law, part of the Australian takeover, of course, of international law in the UK. We have professors of international law there. In fact, many who are Sydney siders like myself. So you'd be pleased to know by that power. At the same stage, um, Julian mentioned the firms I'd been in when, because when I was here working for Mallison's, it wasn't as global as it's become. And indeed, the other firm I worked for, which was in London, was uh, Herbert Smith, which is, of course has now been taken over by Freehills. Sorry, now been part of the merger with Freehills. Um, the other inter interesting point which uh, Julian mentioned is about the time has come. I've been working in this field, believe it or not, since the early 1990s. Uh, it's because it's always struck me. It's an area which international law has ignored. It's tend to be, well, it's not really about companies at all, about states. Human rights are about the individual and the state, and that's the beginning and end of it. And it's always worried me that is not actually where most people's daily lives are about. In fact, as your example gave, with two thirds of the complaints arising uh, in human rights in this country are in that context. It shows that this is an area that really demands to be looked at. So uh, let me just begin by a couple of um, examples of areas and companies where it really matters human rights uh, in, in Australia. I've just got a few there. Anvil Mining, uh, <clears throat> a case against it involving its uh, activities in the Democratic Republic of Congo, rape, torture, slave labor, uh, the, that was then bought out by MMG, a Chinese uh, company. Uh, then we have uh, ANZ currently being uh, criticised for its role in relation to financing of sugar in Cambodia and the uh, labour problems there. And G4S in its role in Manus Island, not an area that, because uh, uh, the, the Human Rights Commission has been dealing with at all. But of course, you know very much about that kind of thing. And I just give those examples when I could have given many. Sadly enough, there are many examples uh, of, of, of companies in this country which are abusing human rights. But I give those to show a range of things. Firstly, that it can be the companies directly abusing human rights themselves, but can also be as part of their uh, secondary role or part of a supply chain or part of financing. It's not as if it has to be just one role. The second area is in relation to different industry sectors. I've given three industry sectors there, but there are many, many more in which it's not as if it's just in, in one area or another. Only last week there was a um, report, for I think by Baptist Union, about uh, the electronics industry. So these are across sectors. And also, they needn't always be about what happens overseas. It can happen in Australia. It can happen about issues in Australia about human rights in Australia. And also, it can be whether or not they're operating here, headquartered here, registered here, incorporated here. Those are all activities in Australia affecting human rights in some way or another. So that's the context within which I want to speak. So moving on really to the UN guiding principles of human rights, because they are the framework. They are the very much the, the context within which we, we need to look at this. There are some problems with the with, with these guiding principles, but largely they set the framework and they've been applied in many different ways. And there are uh, three major, as they call, pillars in this. Many of you will know this. The first one is, of course, the state has a duty to protect human rights, a legal duty arising from a state's uh, ratification of human rights treaties. Secondly, corporations have a responsibility to respect human rights. Question, is that voluntary or not? I'll look at that a little bit later. And finally, the third pillar, often the forgotten pillar, is about access to effective remedies. And yet it is a crucial element of this process. It's conditional because you need the other pillars for it to work. Ooh. We'll get there. I've obviously done something I shouldn't. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things very much, the, the, 
other important aspect is this. We're not talking about some corporations, just big ones. We're not talking about only transnational, every single company. And it can affect every single human rights. It's not a pick and choose. It's not saying some human rights matter and some don't to companies. Every single human right matters. And that's quite an important statement in terms of the context of this area. So let me just have a look at the, the first one, the state duty to protect human rights. And that's set out in Guiding Principle 1. Guiding Principle 1 says states must protect against human rights abuse within their territory and jurisdiction by third parties, including business enterprises. So it's not just about state action. Already we've made this clear statement. It's not just about what states do, it's also about uh, business. And so it's actions and omissions by state agents, but also an act and omission by a non-state actor. I'll give you the example, G4S, I already mentioned that earlier. Arguably, they are acting simply under the power and control of the state. The state is still responsible. But actually there's a second element. There's a big movement in private security companies in which they have their own obligations in human rights and humanitarian law. And there's actually an international code of conduct on this area, which is developing and, and hopefully will get beyond self-regulation to international regulation. But it's quite crucial to recognize this. One way I often, um, uh, when I look at this area, let me just see if I've got the, there we go. Australia open for business. What a lovely phrase. What a great way of saying this is actually what Australia is about. But it forgets that Australia open for business actually means only we should be careful about the businesses we are attracting and careful about what we're wanting of our businesses. To give you an example, if you look at a trade mission today, when the Prime Minister or the, uh, one of the ministers goes overseas on a trade mission, it used to be they went with a few of the kind of public servants and a few other ministers and one or two people. Now the latest one had 365 people, almost all of whom were companies. State is heavily involved in what then goes on. So the state can't then say, well, we didn't know this is what's going to happen. They've gone there and they've helped propagate that trade. They've been involved. There is an issue. Are they complicit in it? And so they need to regulate and control those corporations domiciled. And I use that word deliberately. I don't mean just incorporated. I mean operating, engaged, having bases here. They need to have that degree of control. And the big issue, and, it's, and it is a matter still of contention, what about transnational effects? Because arguably, under good public international law, a state only has control over matters within its territory or jurisdiction. So if a company goes overseas and operates somewhere else, arguably it has nothing to do with Australia, particularly very often, in many instances, that company will operate through another company, maybe registered in that state. Does that mean uh, there is no sense of responsibility by the Australian state in it? I would argue there is. In the same way, there is a number of bits of legislation which Australia has introduced, sex tourism, for example, uh, consumer law, competition law. We don't somehow other block Australia off and say if competition law matters, we don't care about extraterritorial effects. So on human rights, it should be the same because human rights matter of whosever human rights they are, not just of some who we choose to say are within our territory and some who are not. And it's certainly possible to do. You can certainly be able to, um, in financial terms, in director's duties terms, in corporation law terms, have a responsibility on companies to report on their activities wherever they may be. It's not an impossibility. But that is nevertheless an area of quite considerable uh, discussion still within the international law framework. And what has happened is there is more and more specific legislation on this. In the UK, in France, in the US, EU has a non-financial non reporting directive. The equator principles, which are dealing with financial, uh, fund, fu sorry, funding for financial activities in around the world, all of which require some degree of human rights reporting or other requirements within that state. So that legislation is developing. As far as I can find, there's only one bit of legislation in the UK, and one which I'm sure you're all very, sorry, in, the, in Australia, one which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the Illegal Logging Prohibition Act. 
I can see no recognition on that at all. <laughs> it deals with supply chain. It is actually a responsibility on a company involved in, in logging to make uh, reports about its supply chain, that there is no, no illegal logging going on. So it is possible to have this type of legislation. It's not an impossibility. And yet it is very, very rare uh, in Australia. And so whereas there's a clear state duty to uh, protect, in fact, there's very little of that happening. And yet there are other ways to do it. I often think we should look at the carrot and the stick element. Public procurement is a way. And export credit. When you engage with, when we look at uh, companies going overseas, very often they have degree of trade credits, export credits given to them to encourage it. And public procurement, you know, defence forces, government often is out there procuring. It's very possible to put in there a requirement for that company to comply with human rights. There are ways of making carrots within this process. And finally, there needs to be some degree of compliance or enforcement level, not just left to be self-regulation. So that's a state duty. It's a clear duty. And it's for every single state. I've given examples of, of a few. But the extraordinary thing is, every single state in the world has ratified at least one of the major global human rights treaties. That may sound extraordinary. I'm not saying they comply with them, but by, com by ratifying, they agree there is international law requiring protection of human rights. That is an amazing step. So that's what states should do and required to do under international human rights law. But the big development is obviously in the second area, in the sense of the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And I'm going to look at uh, two major elements of that corporate responsibility. The first one is in relation to actually what, are the, what is their responsibility. It has two elements, two parts. The first in relation to avoid causing or contributing themselves by their own activities. And the second is to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts caused, if you like, by a third party. And so that raises two different elements. The first one is their own responsibility is what might be called a no fault or even a strict liability. If they have caused or contributed to the human rights impact, then the company is responsible. That's quite a strong statement, but that's potentially, that is the statement of the UN guiding principles. And that's even if they are not negligent. The second, oh, slightly lost some of it. In relation to third parties, there's a due diligence responsibility, a responsibility to do no harm, a responsibility in which um, it can occur, say, for example, supply contracts, the value chain, the sense to which there is a responsibility to check, to follow up, not to be negligent, negligent in this. And I think there's a sense to which that is certainly a way of putting pressure on companies. And also in relation to that, the terminology used to use leverage. The company should use leverage. In many instances, the companies are much more powerful than the state, much more powerful. And yet, somehow or other, we think they can't do it. And there's now quite an old example, but you'll probably know BHP in Bougainville. I was slightly involved with it at the time. And BHP had so much more powerful, so much more power than the Papua New Guinea government in relation to that area. That's the sense of power and that's the sense of which leverage. Companies can make a difference. Some instances they can't, but in some they can. But there are these two forms of responsibility. The, the second area is in relation to actually something Abigail's already mentioned, the issue of a human rights due diligence. Now, what that means is, is that we're not talking about just corporate social responsibility. Every company just about will have a nice corporate social responsibility policy. Uh, very often uh, they might ask me in and they'll then stick on their annual report, oh, Professor Rob McCorkadale has given approval. I haven't given approval. I might have been involved in the process. But corporate social responsibility in the end is about helping the company. Whereas corporate responsibility to respect human rights is about human rights impact. They are two different things. In the end, we see, for example, a company may well, um, part of their CSR policy might help, I don't know, uh, children's playgrounds. I think that's a fabulous thing. Then we see it happens to be Nike or Adidas or one of those companies. Why are they doing children's playgrounds? Because they're potential consumers, not because of human rights impacts. So you have to be careful about CSR being the same. 
as her human rights. And I apologize for all the CSR people in the room when I say that. There's a, the other element is there's a difference between ordinary due diligence. Those of you who are lawyers, you know what due diligence is. One, the mergers and acquisitions, for example. One company buys another, you do due diligence. You check about debts, you check about all those kind of things. That is business due diligence risk management. Human rights due diligence is about impacts. W what impacts are that company making? It could be on their own employees, fine, but it's probably on the communities, on the indigenous people, on the others who are outside the company, looking at the impact. So it's a very different vision. And so it's looking, as I have given comparisons to risk and impact, internal and external finances and third parties. It's not just about that company's own risks. It, it is possible to argue you could have a defence of human rights due diligence. Let's say, for example, your supply chain, there are various elements in it, and you put in place a code of conduct, all those kind of things, and yet there's still a human rights impact. It might be possible to say, and it's not yet been tested, there's a couple of cases which might indicate this, that a company has undertaken human rights due diligence as a defence. And I think that's where law firms here really need to be good advisors and say, Actually, if you do human rights due diligence, it can in the long run help your own uh, legal case, but also your own public uh, uh, engagement in these issues. Um, the other thing to be careful is, and it's very easy, end up, is to be a tick box exercise. Yes, I've done, like health and safety, you know, I have, you know floors are swept regularly, you know, um, all those kind of things. It has to be about proper due diligence. I was in Sudan, for example, uh, uh, engaging with a group of, of entrepreneurs there and actually looking at that issue and saying, well, it can't be just tick box because what if, for example, your supplier is using child labour? You can just tick, oh, well, I've got a supplier. Actually, you need to look beyond what is the impact of that happening on your both your own risk but also the impact on the children in the area. As part of this is a human rights impact assessment. We're reasonably comfortable, particularly in Australia, with environmental impact assessments, but there's not much yet human rights impact assessment. It's a developing area, still learning on it, but I think it's something which should become part of every company's learning and process, which includes consultation. Now, we're familiar with consultation, for better or worse, in relation to the indigenous community. But in human rights due diligence, that consultation has to ha happen at a very early stage and not just rely on the host state. Why do I say that? In interesting, for example, there's a case which came out of Peru where the company says, oh, we, you know, we had nothing to do with it. The company, the, the state simply said, this is state land, you can go in there and of course go ahead and do anything you don't need to consult. Because it wasn't state land. It was actually the people of the community's land. So there needs to be a great deal more care sometimes in checking the actual responsibilities you have in relation to the host state. And then tracking and implementation. Not just doing a one-off exercise, not doing it once and saying, we don't need to do it again. It has to be a regular process, has to be a process too, in which there is checking whenever a major activity occurs, there's checking of that and, and uh, following through on that. And so that uh, what we, it ends up doing is it's an ongoing process which gradually improves the situation. And let me just uh, give an example of the project which uh, Abigail mentioned, which you're working with Norton Rose Fulbright on. We've done a survey of 150 or so major companies around the world looking at what is their practice of human rights due diligence. We then interviewed face to face about 10% of them asking what is their understanding of human rights due diligence because it's at the core of this. You need to have a human rights due diligence process. And what is interesting is firstly 50% don't do it at all and 50% that do say yes of course we do it. We do it because we do it with our employees or we do it for health and safety. That's great, but that is not enough. It's not just about what companies do within their own um, group, within their own um, people. It also has to be other stakeholders. And it's a fascinating way of then saying, okay, how can we help? What are the issues which we can look at? And what's fascinating from this, and I can't quite give you the full details because we haven't finished the report, but what is interesting is actually there's a degree of consistency in, the, in how companies go about it, that actually if they do a human rights due diligence process, they actually find out potential human rights impacts, which they hadn't even thought of. They thought, oh, it's just about employees, that's all we'll look at. 
But when they do a human rights due diligence process, they see it's much more than that. And actually they become both better employers, but also better engagements with their, engages with their community. So it's quite an interesting process in which we are going to offer some kind of um, strategies, if you like, for companies looking at this kind of area. Because we work very much with companies in the aim to improve their process. Yes, it'd be great if there were remedies for victims, but very often a starting point should also be with the companies that they begin changing. Okay, let me then just move on to look at the last of the pillars, access uh, to, to uh, remedies. And this, of course, is a crucial part um, because very often that this is some, very often this is the way that actually uh, change will occur. And there's two forms, both in terms of the state's activity, must have judicial and non-judicial, but also business itself must have effective grievance mechanisms. Now, so in terms of state's action, there needs to be courts and tribunals in place to be able to deal with these issues. Now, that's, of course, a great difficulty when you don't have uh, human rights in legislation, as happens in most other parts of the world. But that doesn't mean you give up. Obviously, there's the Commission here is an enormous and important role. There's also the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, which Australia is a part, which is a national contact point. I wonder how many of you even knew of this. That's great, except the national contact point is in the Treasury in Canberra, not independent. It is part of the Treasury. How much confidence can one have in a body which is meant to review a complaint against a company when Australia is open for business. How much confidence can you have on an independent uh, responsibility in this area if it's one in which, in fact, there's been almost no successful complaints? In fact, the one against G4S was, was dismissed by the National Contact Point as it was really all about government policy and not about G4S and that there was uh, some legal action which might occur elsewhere, and so no remedy was given. So it's a real problem if those national contact points aren't more energetic and more engaged. And that criticism I make of national contact points around the world, uh, Australia's not unique in this. But also in terms of corporate action, early um, grievance mechanisms are really important and not conditional. I'll give you an example. Barrack Holdings had uh, very uh, strong and long um, uh, aspects about grievance mechanisms but those who brought a grievance had to sign a form saying well they couldn't then bring a separate legal action now that's problematic if, if you really if the grievance mechanism isn't successful as a form of fully understanding that grievance so nevertheless that is near I think of development which hasn't really been explored very much but it is a way I think if companies did this, often it would lead to a lot less human rights complaints happening later. So a few other elements about access to remedy. I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to talk about law. There are two ways, both civil law through tort and contract and, of course, through um, criminal law. Interestingly enough, in the common law countries, there's very little use of criminal law in this area, but it is possible. It is certainly possible, the Commonwealth Criminal Code, um, I think it's um, Article 12.1 of the, the schedule, actually allows for corporates to have responsibility for criminal actions. But they're very rarely taken out. There's an example in, in the Netherlands which didn't get very far. But tort is the other area, and it's a massive development in this area uh, in terms of looking at um, the, particularly the duty of care. Let me just give a couple of examples. The starting point is, when looking at a tort case, often the who is the defendant is a crucial issue because finding that out is not easy. Many companies are very complex organisations and if you've got a situation where you think it's the company which maybe is in the Democratic Republic of Congo but is now operating here but through a different company, it's actually very difficult to do. So part of the development has been in relation to duty of care. A very interesting case in The Hague, Akban and, and Shell, where could actually there be somebody bring a complaint against Shell, both Shell in the Netherlands and Shell in Nigeria. And the, uh, the Dutch court said, yes, it is possible to sue both if it's evident that the company, the, 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 the um, 
parent company is controlling the particular issue. And an excellent example of that is the case of Chandra and Cape, a recent decision in the, uh, 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 the Court of Appeal of the UK, where they held that where a company, in this case it was about asbestos, the company really knew what was going on, the head parent company, they couldn't say it's not our duty of care. But what you're doing is you're leapfrogging really the subsidiary to look at the parent company's responsibilities. So it's not always easy to do, particularly when, I mean, after all, we, as we know in basic company law, the idea is that companies um, you know, have their kind of shield. You know, the sense of veil of incorporation means that you can't jump one to the other. But the courts are beginning to recognise. And what's fascinating in this, the terminology used in the UN Guiding Principles is a business enterprise. It's not corporations, it's not parent and subsidiary, it's not joint venture, because there are so many types of engagement of, parent, of, of, of corporations. And that I think the courts need to begin to be alert to this and not pretend that actually a, a, a company which is controlling, let's say, you know, the whole of the determination of recruitment, for example, from the headquarters, they have a responsibility then of what happens on the ground, let's say, if there's discrimination. Um, the other area uh, in relation to this is actually it's very, very hard. It's not easy to bring a case. Hard to get evidence, hard, hard to in terms of legal costs. So it's not an easy area. Um, and then there's two errors. There's a claim in the host state itself, the state where the human rights ha has been breached. Often has runs in difficulty because there's a lack of a rule of law, lack of independent judiciary. And yet we find in many home states, they say, it's forum non-convenience. You can't come to us. You should sort it out elsewhere. You should somehow or other find a judge who's independent in the Democratic Republic of Congo or pick another country and sort it out there. That is simply a very poor legal argument today and being completely abandoned in the European Union. Across the whole European Union, you cannot use forum non-convenience anymore because they realise it's a very false argument. But it still exists in this country, still exists in Canada, but it's a very poor argument where people actually cannot get remedies in their home countries. There's also the er 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 element, as you probably know from private international law, what's the applicable law? Just because the case may be brought in Australia doesn't mean the tort responsibility is going to be the same as in Australia. It happens in Cambodia. It doesn't necessarily mean the relevant law will be Australian law. It may well be Cambodian law about responsibility. So these are areas which will require enormous thinking, enormous innovative ideas by those in law firms, by those in uh, civil society and elsewhere. The other major development in this area is, of course, the Kyogel case, which you're probably aware of, where the Supreme Court of the US, looking at the Alien Tort Claims Act, uh, held that there's a presumption against extraterritoriality. Led to a lot of uh, depression by my colleagues in the, in the US. I'm not as depressed. I just think there was always a slightly strange act, um, this area. It doesn't mean there aren't still tort claims to be able to be brought. And there will be some cases where, in fact, it'll still be applicable. But if you like, it show, can often show the limits of specific legislation. Um, the other point just to make on this uh, really is part of my concern about a lot of these developments, particularly in tort law, is how they have to be pleaded. I'll give you an example, a case called Montoreco, which is in relation to northern Peru copper mining. Um, people were raped, were tortured, were detained, the case is brought in, in, in terms of tort law, of negligence, of, um, they don't mention human rights as a claim. Why not? Because that's not actually how tort is pleaded, which can be very difficult for the community if you have to argue in language which is not human rights language. But just if you'd like to raise that as, as an issue. Okay, having set the scene, what are some of the ways forward? Oh, done it again. Ah, hey. Um, so what are some of the ways forward? Well, uh, let me think about the, the, the state itself. What is the role of, of states? Well, partly is to bring in much more regulation, much more practices and more incentives, and to support the expectations of many in the community that there needs to be some regulation of business activity without harming business activity. Indeed, in many instances, it can be really good for a company if they can show they are actively protecting human rights. After all, you know, the area of, of ethics and corruption is area where companies say, listen, we aren't doing this. Actually, they can get the contract. 
because actually they are much more appealing as a potential investor. In relation to one other area, should there be a treaty on this? I've been involved in the issue of treaty. I'm to some extent giving sort of advice to Ecuador on this. Um, really just saying what are the international legal principles and if I can say within these walls, I'm not necessarily convinced there should be a treaty, partly because states don't comply with their human rights obligations, are they necessarily going to comply with a new treaty? I think if they made the brave step and made corporations directly responsible, that would be a groundbreaking move. So we'll see. But that we're very early stages of whether this will occur or not. But I think what we, we need to recognise is that states need to take action. They need to regulate. Why? Because whenever I talk to companies, they say, yes, we can do some self-regulation, but actually it really helps us if we know what the position is. The, the big changes, for example, in, in, in a range of different uh, areas, uh, for example, the UK has the Modern Slavery Act, has, has Bribery uh, Act, both of which set clear parameters, which then companies know what they're meant to do. So Ruggie is right. Government shouldn't assume they're helping business by doing nothing. That does not help business. Clarity does. And I think governments need to hear that action, hear that much louder, because I think companies are otherwise left in this uncertainty where they're getting hammered often by the media, by civil society, and saying, well, we don't know what we're meant to do. In relation to um, uh, corporate practices, well, Companies look at risk. Risk is their main engagement, risk, risk management. But there are real risks in relation to this area. There are financial risk, the operational risk. If, they, if the anvil mining stops mining, then they are losing a lot of income. There are reputational risks, serious reputational risks. And of course, there are legal risks, action against them. There's also, of course, external and internal pressure. When I first began doing this, as I said, in the early 1990s, it was with, with a big mining company, and they were aware they were not attracting good employees. People did not want to work for them. Why? Because of their human rights and environmental abuses. So there's internal and external pressure. And I rather love this uh, quote from the then Nike CEO. We do not like the fact that Nike product has become synonymous with slave wages, forced overtime, and arbitrary abuse. And in a way, that's, that's the difficulty, that if they, do, if they don't take any action, if they're not giving the legal advice, if they're not aware of these issues, that's the risk that they can run. It's, it's not perfect because companies which have a consumer um, engagement will have much more pressure. But if you make, I don't know, this microphone, people aren't going to go out in the street and refuse to buy the microphone. So we have to be careful not only to be consumer focused, but actually put regulation for all. And the other point I want to make is that actually companies are beginning to do this more and more. Most companies are beginning to follow some codes of conduct, some kind of method of, of, of doing this. That has positives and negatives. There's a couple of interesting recent Canadian cases, one called Chock and Hud Bay, and one called Joe Fresh, both of which there was a code of conduct. Joe Fresh, for example, is about the Rana Plaza, the Bangladesh garment industry, which um, uh, led to a huge collapse and, and deaths in, in, of, of buildings uh, in, in uh, Bangladesh. And the issue is, well, what about their supply chains? They said, we have a code of conduct, but if it's voluntary and it's not monitored, you're not actually following through on your responsibilities in this area. There's a recent one, the Singapore banks are beginning to say this. And inter interestingly enough, part of the reason for that is the Indonesian haze, that actually there's a consequence of, if you, if you leave unregulated what co corporations do, you can have consequences in the region. Um, the other thing is just companies are aware that what is soft law can become hard law. What was you shouldn't do bribery and corruption becomes hard law, and a bribery act. The uh, American um, uh, acts also, uh, legislation also in this area. So there is this movement. And I think if we are good lawyers, we begin to be alert to that and put that up front and not just say, well, the law is where it's at and we're not going to look any further. So I think that um, when we're looking at ways forward, um, remedies are really crucial. And what are those remedies? Well, they have to be both remedies which are by state providing access, by providing reparation, and by a good national contact point. Also, in relation to um, 
corporation having early and accessible remedies. And also in relation to um, the broader community having better information. I mean, I notice, for example, the uh, AHRC have very useful information on this area, which is downloadable from their website. There is a way in which you can absolutely improve information and decrease the barriers in this. One other point I have to make, those of you who are lawyers, good legal advice is crucial in this area because in the end, you're also assisting in managing risk. But be aware, a law firm is a corporation, it's a business enterprise. So law firms also have their own responsibility. Sorry about that. <laughs> so just be aware that not only do you need good legal advice for those you're representing, your clients, but be aware that actually there's your own responsibility as well. So let me just uh, finish really with the commentary from the UN Guiding Principles, which says, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights is a global standard, not just one country or another standard. And it exists independently of the state's ability and willingness uh, to fulfill their own human rights obligation. And it exists over and above compliance with local law. Now that's a high responsibility in the corporation. And it should start with the state taking action. But in the absence of the state, the corporation still has this responsibility to respect human rights. And that responsibility, although starting off as being voluntary, is becoming less and less voluntary and more and more moving towards compliance. And, and we, some extent, we in this room can make that difference. Thank you. developing research on is the extent to which human rights is good for business yeah. and that really comes through some of the points that you're making that there are there's quite a body of research now that demonstrates with a diverse workforce with understanding more about your client base more open uh, and respecting human rights meets not only the younger ones that are coming in and want to work for an ethical company but it's actually got a got a an outcome in terms of the share price Absolutely. and ingenuity and effectiveness within the company itself. And another point that uh, actually rather intrigues me is with regard to lawyers' advice. Uh, just last year, we had some new um, codes of conduct coming in for the new national legal profession, which is not national, as you may know, typically in <laughs> Australia. We talk about national, but what we mean is New South Wales and Victoria, exactly. the only ones that came in. But there is an obligation now in the code of conduct uh, that they must act can, uh, ethically. Uh, but they must also act in by reference to human rights to be defined by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Oh, brilliant. We were not consulted about this, but I was, uh, <laughs> I was uh, rather intrigued. Uh, so we know Lord knows how it's actually going to work out in practice, but, um, but I think your point is an important one. Lawyers play a very important role in this. But, but perhaps I'll start off with a, with a question, if I may, and that is I've never been quite sure about this. If you say it's a voluntary code of conduct, a code of ethics, um, it, it has to be more if we talk about remedies as you've done. In other words, to have a remedy, you've got to have an obligation. So really, we're, we're moving away from something which is essentially a voluntary ethical code, but something which is grounded in law, where a remedy must be provided, but where the mechanism to achieve that remedy is, is going to vary, depending on whether it's tort law or criminal law or, or whatever it is, alien tort claims legislation or whatever. It's fascinating mm -hmm. uh, that we haven't really got a a clear way forward to determine what the legal obligation is in order to determine the remedy. Well, I think uh, one of the ways that John Ruggy tried to get companies on, bo on board was to say, you know, it is voluntary and somehow we'll work out the remedy. But you're quite right. It, it's incoherent to say you have a remedy without actually having a responsibility which is legally um, uh, crafted. Part of his argument was the grievance mechanism part is a remedy, but my view is often that isn't a remedy. It's a very much a holding pattern, or it's useful for employees, but completely inapplicable for a community which have been pushed off their land. So he, he used that to get companies on board, but I think in fact what's happening is it's moving away from that voluntary. And, and I think, as, as the, I gave a couple of those Canadian cases where they had codes of conduct, they're then being implied by the courts because otherwise it's misrepresentation. Can I ask the questions? Yes. Uh, the gentleman, the, 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 could, could you, do you mind telling us uh, sure. who you are and, yes. um, and practice your question? Okay, John Della. Um, I'm from the Fallon Duffer Association. 
Um, many of you might know there's been a Senate Economics uh, Review inquiry into the um, Foreign Investment Review Board um, practices. Um, something that I've been involved with others is looking at the uh, state-owned enterprises of China. Uh, because as many of you know, the, the uh, Communist Party appoints the senior officials, they're not general board of directors, um, as we might expect in a Western corporation. So they, the interesting thing from our point of view is that Falun Gong practitioners have been persecuted through a lot of those state-owned enterprises in China. And uh, those same state-owned enterprises are being, uh, there's one listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, and they're also um, you know, seeking to invest here. And the Foreign Investment Review Board procedure, I think it just um, has that recommendation for following OECD guidelines, which um, requires uh, the enterprises to recognise the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So do, do you have any feedback on what more the uh, Foreign Investment Review Board could do to assess these uh, state-owned enterprises? It's a very good question. Interestingly enough, the um, UN guiding principles do expressly deal with state-owned enterprises, and they say state-owned enterprises fall largely within the state duty to protect human rights. And so it's actually, a China, in that instance, a Chinese government obligation to comply with, with human rights. So there is already that. Of course, they tend to operate as if they aren't state-owned, but in strict kind of application of the guiding principles, they, the, the state, China, if they're in control of this organisation, they must uh, comply with, with human rights under the UN guiding principles. Having said that, I, I um, have had a student who's working a little bit on the variety of state-owned enterprise in China, and there are many. They have all, a whole range of different degrees of effective control. And that can be very difficult then to work out the extent to which actually the Chinese government really has control of that. And if they don't, then they fall in the second pillar of corporate responsibility to respect. So it's not as if they fall outside the system by any means. Amy Sinclair, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. Um, in the last few months, we are increasingly seeing moves in Australia, um, a momentum gathering around the development of a national um, action plan on Great. business and human rights. Um, and I'm interested in your view on NAPS and their role and efficacy um, within the business and human rights agenda, and particularly in terms of driving uptake of the UN guiding principles. That, that's a, a very interesting development, that um, all states are meant to introduce a national action plan on business and human rights. In fact, only about, I think it's eight or so, have done so to date. Uh, and uh, Australia is way behind a development compared to some other states. I've been a bit, a bit involved both in the UK and in Ireland in dealing with the issue of a national action plan. The, the, the main purpose has so far been of these national, national action plans is changing expectations on, on companies, partly doing what Gillian talked about, saying to companies actually there is a good business reason to protect human rights and stating that up front. And I think that is an important part of the process. But this, the, the other part which has been very weak in, in, in terms of all the national action plans is putting in place remedies. Uh, in the UK, for example, the, um, the, there is really no new remedy provided other than the Corporations Act, which the companies need to report on this, and reporting can be very weak. Um, though what is, it's meant is when new legislation comes, across, comes, comes involved, such as the Modern Slavery Act, which only came into, the, into existence last year in the UK, there was able to, civil society groups were able to insert within that corporate responsibility in relation to this area because the National Action Plan gave them impetus to do it. In Ireland, it was a very different case because Ireland is attract, trying to attract business by having very low corporate rates but, um, of, of taxation. So they don't actually want to put in place some kind of um, uh, requirements on companies to comply with human rights. So they're in this very different kind of um, balance. I'm involved in the Indonesian process in relation to the National Action Plan. And actually there's a lot of development within the um, civil society to push for that because it begins to set out clear government policy, even if not always in legislation. So I think there is a significant um, uh, um, probability that by having a National Action Plan, it begins to generate much more momentum. But also if it's done well with consultation, actually companies begin taking on board and feel this is something which they should be uh, 
engaging with and not just something which is for other people somehow or other. So I, I think it, it's worthwhile keeping on pressing on that. Hi, um, I'm Vam, I'm a student. Um, I was just wondering, like, how do we make sure that like supply and chain auditing actually results in harm minimization? Because um, just refusing to like contract with a company that has like human like child labor or something um, could probably result in that child like floating from a textile industry to like a sex slave, you know, sort of thing. So, how do we actually make sure that we're helping? I think the supply chain issues are interesting. Let me give you an example. I was involved in a company who was working in um, parts of Central Asia, and they, were, they have some of those kind of uh, issues of child labour, but forced labour in particular was, was a real issue. Um, and what they decided was they would disinvest. And the problem of disinvesting is exactly as you then say, you end up pulling out and not actually offering a, a means of leverage to, to change things. But they found they were trying and trying to change things without success. So I think there is, there's no one method for, for, for every single um, uh, company. The other aspect of supply chains, um, I, I was working with, uh, the, um, with Nestle, which remarkably has one of the few people who actually is a human rights manager in, in Nestle. And uh, she was saying that, um, they have something like 170,000 first-tier suppliers. And so, yes, they put in place codes of conduct, but they don't then monitor it. And that's part of the problem is there's no monitoring of that. You can have a code of conduct. It might even say, if you breach human rights, then this contract is ended. It strikes me that is not the right way forward, that you need to have, if you put in place monitoring, you can then put in place assistance rather than just either disinvesting or cancelling the contract. So I think it's a, a more nuanced response than one or the other to try and improve this area. Oh, you're Vega from the Australian Women's Chamber of Commerce. Just as a continuation of that question, we've seen lots of reports. Oh, thank you. Could you, could you repeat again? Yep, sorry, Yolanda Vega um, with the Australian Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. As a continuation of that comment and the question from um, the student, we're seeing a lot of reports now about modern slavery. You've, you've mentioned Nike. We've seen Four Corners um, reports about Apple and a variety of other companies. Considering these supply chain issues are the concern of everybody and considering it's the majority women and children that are being abused and used as slaves, and on the other hand, considering that in first world or you know um, first world economies, developed economies, it is women that are the biggest buyers and consumers, and yet we're the ones that are you know mainly concerned. How do we bring that point together? How do we educate the buyers that we're actually? abusing or using slavery when we buy that five dollar t-shirt or when we're buying the Cadbury's chocolates of the world because everybody seems to be concerned about it but I'm hoping that you can give us a remedy because we've been advocating about you know including women in supply chains and stopping slavery amongst women but we're not getting very far professor um, you, you make a very fair point I guess I'd come at it from a couple of things firstly it'll only work for companies who have a consumer good like the, the, the $5 t-shirts. If you're supplying things which are doing just as much damage, but we're not actually seeing it in our consumer, then the consumer's not going to respond. But the, but the second point is the consumers are very fickle. They did fascinating surveys on when will a consumer make an ethical choice? And you ask them before they go shopping, then when they go shopping, oh, that's a cheap t-shirt, I'll buy that. You, you, we, we all tend to do it, we tend to throw out that. That's why I think the, the way forward has to be requirement in legislation of companies to report. Because if they don't, then there's no real incentive. The, the consumer is, a very, is not always going to go and say, well, we're not gonna choose this t-shirt, we're gonna choose the more expensive. At the same stage, we have to have encouragement. Fair trade goods have taken off. I mean, there was a period when, old enough to know, where you know you would never buy a fair trade good. Nowadays, 
they're always going to have that. In the same way, there's a whole range of really good environmentally friendly goods, which you will also choose. So I think it is a slow movement, and being able to say again and again, this is a better choice. And it's a better choice because the remarkable thing is we care about women and children in other countries. I mean, that is an amazing thing to start with. Why should we begin to care? And yet the extraordinarily amazing thing of human rights is we do care. We do care about the woman on the sugar uh, plantation in Cambodia. We do care about the child labour in Bangladesh because actually everybody's human rights are protected if we care about those. So I can't pretend there's a one fix, but I think it can't be just consumer pressure and it can't be uh, just leaving it to the corporations. There also needs to be regulation which will be pushed by consumer pressure. I mean, the Modern Slavery Act in the UK came out of actually civil society pressure saying, we can't just pick and choose. The Rana Plaza example was a garment sector, which do supply you know, $5 t-shirts. And they said, that is not enough. We need to make sure that companies are reporting on that there's nothing down their supply chain, which is any form of slavery. So keep pressing on that. I think one last question, or perhaps two, and then, we're, then we must finish, because we do like to finish on time if we can at these lunchtime events. Uh, Professor, you've spoken about tort law and contract law, but you haven't really touched upon directors' duties and corporate law. Could you give us your thoughts on the impact that can have in this area? Um, sure. I mean, interestingly enough, in South Africa, there is now a requirement under the South African company law for all companies to report on social impacts. Now that of course comes out of a heritage in, in South Africa of long-term discrimination. Uh, there's a something in Italian company law, there's something now in the UK company law uh, which requires um, companies to report on their process of um, uh, social and environmental activity. So I think in terms of director's duties, it's, it's a very weak process at the moment of you, you need to report. I think it's completely feasible to move to a position where part of a director's duty is and includes consideration of human rights matters. It wouldn't be an impossibility for that to be part of a director's duty. Uh, and I think that will be where it'll move to, and that would be a very powerful way. I mentioned about the Singaporean banks. The Singapore Stock Exchange is also thinking of bringing in some requirements like this. And I think if stock exchanges and corporate law began working together, actually would make massive changes, relatively simply, but being governed by the recognition that in the end, the stakeholders, the shareholders, actually want to hear this information. Why? Because it actually makes a difference on the share price. If you know what's happening you know, in the company, that they can't just pretend that everything is fine when actually there's this huge uh, human rights due diligence which has not been done and could well affect the company. Last question there. Uh, my name's Robbie Maggier. I'm from the National Union of Students. Um, so coming from a completely different side to this, the advocacy side. So we see education as a fundamental human right and it is prescribed as such. Um, but in Australia, education is treated like a marketable business um, with profits um, being at the centre of what universities often do, um, particularly when it comes to international students. One area we're trying to see this change is with the price of textbooks and seeing the repeal of parallel import restrictions so we can import identical content from overseas to Australia. But the problem with this is we're faced with a contention of human rights. We have the contention of, you know, it drives down prices for students and education becomes more accessible. But then we're potentially causing issues overseas with uh, slave wages um, and poor working conditions for those who will be ultimately printing our textbooks. How do you go about um, ad advocating for change in one area for one human right when it potentially is in contention with another? Oh, that's a, I don't <laughs> pretend to have one easy answer. The, the starting point is that human rights do interact with each other. There's no priority between human rights. Um, you know, just as important to have access to water as it is to have freedom of expression. There's no priority between one human right and another. That doesn't mean they don't often interact. Rarely are they in conflict really is actually one human rights in conflict directly with another. In relation to the kind of issue which, which, which you're exploring, it's almost the same kind of question was asked about supply chains, looking at what happens and your means of leverage to make sure actually the books that you are receiving are not ones produced in, in a environment which actually you feel are abusing women, children or whatever. So I think actually that's quite an important statement which could well, to come back to your point, actually affect the student consumers to think about 
the books that they're getting or think about the consequence of the books that maybe they're then um, sending elsewhere. And actually part of that is raising the uh, awareness of this issue really is quite crucial in a way that's why I give these talks because actually the awareness needs to be raised at so many levels, at government level, at corporate level, at consumer level and at students and, and as us as ordinary people in our engagement, so thinking that actually these human rights matter and it's not just about what governments do but it's also what corporations do because in most people's daily lives around the world, particularly in, in developing countries, their main engagement is going to be much more with a corporate um, body or a community body than they are going to have the state. The state will often be very, very distant. So actually we make a change here and we say, actually, companies have human rights obligations. Then we begin to lead towards, I hope, a greater protection of human rights generally. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert. And I'd just like to finish with it with a couple of things. One is um, the good news uh, on, on human rights in Australia, which is a long way behind the European world in which you operate, uh, is that a local school here has just uh, determined that all their uniforms are to be sourced through fair trade. And the idea apparently is catching on. Um, and the other is I'm reminded, I don't know that it's still the case, but the Naki slogan, slogan used to be, just do it. Well, now you can't just do it. You've got to think about the consequences of, of what you do. Um, so it's a huge pleasure to have you um, of bringing in this uh, the, really a very sophisticated discussion that we're not having really in Australia as we should. And, uh, and your leadership's uh, uh, great in, in bringing it to all our attention. So thank you very much. And please join me in thank you very much.